Hello, everyone. A uh, warm welcome to this PAVA conference. And uh, I thank you for your attendance. Before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this is a reminder to participants to mute their microphones and videos apart from the speakers. For organizational purposes, I propose to have the questions at the end of the session after all the speakers have finished. So please submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Now, this session will feature two very contrasting experiences of change management in AV archives on two continents, one from Australia and the other from Africa, Malawi. The first presentation will describe the restructuring of the National Film and Sound Archives of Australia, NFSA. This process started in 2019, and we will learn about the impact that this has had on the delivery of objectives and priorities. The speakers for this session are Nancy Ayers and Jackie Ullman. Nancy is the acting CEO at the NFSA. She has over 20 years experience working in executive, finance, change, and risk management positions, operating at director level for 12 years. Nancy's experience spans a number of different industries, geographies, and skill sets. During her most recent roles, which include the chief operating officer and chief of staff role at the NFSA, leading the business improvement functions at the NFSA and the Australian National University, and working with Price Waterhouse Coopers Consulting. Nancy has focused on organization transformation. Jackie, Jackie Ullman, commenced as head of collections at the National Film and Sound Archive in December 2020, having previously been the NFA's Senior manager, manager of Strategy and Engagement. Most recently, she was Director of Visual Arts and Design in the Australian Government Office for the Arts. Jackie has worked on major policy initiatives in the Australian Government Arts portfolio, including reforms such as the 2013 National Cultural Policy, the 2011 Review of the Australia Council, and the 2010 Review of Private Sector Support for the Arts. Jackie has a Bachelor of, of Law and a Bachelor of Arts degree. She's a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and alumna of the Australia Council's Art Leadership Program. Ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joey. I appreciate the introduction and good afternoon, everybody. It's early evening here in Australia. I'm delighted to join you all in this year's CPAVA conference with the fitting theme of audiovisual archiving through times of change. I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands from which myself and Jackie present from, the Ngunnawal people, and I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. As Joey said, my name is Nancy Ayres and I'm the Acting CEO of the National Film and Sound Archive in Australia and I'm co-presenting today with Jackie Allman, who is our Head of Collection. Jackie's going to introduce herself in the second half of our presentation. Just going to start sharing my screen now. Great. Right. Uh, today, we are pleased to share with you uh, an update on the NFSA's digital transformation. To begin with, I would like to revisit the place of audiovisual archiving in a digital world. I'll then share with you some of the foundation projects that the NFSA has completed in recent years uh, to support our digital growth. I'll speak about our data analytics function and our shift in staffing profile over recent years. I'll then provide you with an overview of two pilot projects, which the NFSA is part of. The first is applying machine learning to our collection to unlock our collection by providing valuable searchable metadata of content. The second is a project which we're working on with RMIT, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, and that's to explore the future of blockchain. 
I'll then share with you our progress on ramping up our digitisation efforts, in particular for our at-risk items, and I'll leave you with some thoughts as to our biggest area of risk, our digital storage, and what our plans are in this space. I'll pass to Jackie, who will share with you our plans for three key areas of digital transformation, which we're just beginning. The build of an acquisitions portal, the establishment of born digital workflows, and our search the collection project. So our digital world. I've enjoyed the presentations, by the way, that came before me today. And, and thank you to the Vietnam Film Institute and the National Archives of the Republic of Indonesia from session one. And thanks also to keynote speaker, Linda Tadic for setting the scene for us today on archiving whilst being conscious of sustainability. So we all, as AV archives, face the same challenge and we face it now. And that is we are collecting and preserving and, and sharing analog material at the same time as we're collecting and preserving born digital material. On top of that, of course, we are digitizing our analog material in order to ensure that it's accessible for future generations. This poses a great risk to audiovisual archives as we're increasingly stretched to fulfill our mandates. To serve our purpose of collecting, preserving and sharing collections, we really need to have a foot in both, in both worlds, the analogue world and the digital world. We are consumed with digitising our analogue collections. However, we also must ensure that we collect as things are created in today's world. Uh, we need to ensure that our changing digital files are upgraded and accessible. We need to engage with users in the way that they expect, and those ways are changing. Oops. We operate in a world where more data is created than we can store, and we send and receive this data at great speed. The technological developments in artificial intelligence, big data analysis, blockchain, etc., cetera, are swift and they're exciting. It brings great opportunity, but it also brings with it great risks, cybersecurity being of primary importance. So how do we keep our digital assets safe when that is our key role? So our world has changed significantly and it continues to, in one, the way that people create their content, two, the way systems and software are used to capture, store and analyse and provide access to that content, and three, as I mentioned earlier, the user expectations. What do people expect from us when they access our collection? How do they want to use our collections? So our digital transformation journey so far. This is a picture of the NFSA building. It's not very digital on the outside, but it's becoming increasingly digital on the inside. I'd like to talk to you about a couple of foundation projects that we've been working on at the NFSA over the past two years, which has in, uh, helped us to progress our digital transformation. The first is our data, data analytics function. Two years ago, we set up a data analytics team and we started small. We had two staff members actually, uh, who had development experience, coding experience. We now have an established analytics site with pro forma reports available to all staff. And this site continues to grow over time. I'm going to flick through a couple of examples of the analytics reports that we've set up. Each of the reports we have are, um, they're active um, and can be, they're interactive, sorry, on the screen, but I can't show that in my presentation today. So I've just taken screenshots of what, of what we can represent. So you'll see here the first example being collection growth and obviously our digital collection uh, has uh, grown rapidly in the early 2000s and beyond. And you'll see below there our audio disc um, collection is starting to taper off as we move into um, digital content creation. And you can see that as well with our moving image. Sorry, moving image down there on the bottom. The second example I'll show you is digital progress. Now, um, in the interactive version of this analytics site, 
as you move your mouse over the um, screen here, you can see every title that's been digitised, the newly digitised material. And this shows newly digitised material in our audio collection. And I've chosen to show you uh, the title there of Women and Children First, a tribute to Nancy, um, because it appealed to me. Um, you can see the same with our film, stills and video progress. Staff at the NFSA love looking at this. It's a great way for users um, internally and externally to engage with what we're digitising at the moment. And we use this um, to advocate for digitisation funding for our collection. We have a digitisation uh, status report, and, um, which we use both internally and also, again, to report to board and to, to report to other stakeholders. This shows, this again is interactive. It shows our digitisation status. This one's filtered for magnetic tape only. The pink being the area we need to uh, digitise with a single copy. Um, purple is to be digitised with multiple copy, where we have multiple copies. And the blue is what we have already digitised. So as you can see in that audio example on the screen there, we've digitised approximately 50% at this stage of our audio collection. On the right-hand side, you can see how we can break that down into the format types. For video, you can see we've digitised approximately 30%. The next example is interesting, another example from the analytics portal, and that is uh, where we have loaned our collection to places overseas. This um, is interesting because recently we realised that we had outstanding loan items all over the world. And until we had this digital image of where things were, uh, we weren't able to track those effectively. So this has uh, greatly uh, increased our, our means of tracking, um, tracking goods. At the moment, you'll see the blue dot there is the um, collection items that we've shared with the BFI for the, um, for, the, for the season this year, the UK screen season. This last one is interesting in that it's a digital representation of a physical uh, problem. And this is our physical collection storage. And um, whilst you can't see a lot of interaction in this screen, it shows each of our vaults where we store our physical collection. Um, and we mapped this, um, we, we did this visualization during COVID where we weren't able to have people in the office, but we were able to have staff out in the vaults um, measuring up what the collection size was and where we're going to reach our capacity in our storage. This is an interactive um, visualization and helps us to see where we're going to reach capacity and when we can project that over time. I'd also like to talk about our changing staffing profile at the NFSA. I mentioned before that archives all over the world, we are, we're struck now more than ever with having to have almost dual workforces. So we need the skills to preserve an analogue collection and formats and skills to deal with the digital. As we know, everything digital evolves and it evolves very quickly. This needs to be taken into consideration when we employ our staff. And instead of recruiting for staff with a specific skill set, the NFSA is recruiting staff who present uh, digital dexterity. Anyone who's heard me present before knows that I, I do love the term digital dexterity, a term that was coined by the Gartner Group. Basically, at the NFSA, we are aiming to employ staff that have the mindset and the capacity to learn and change and evolve with our digital needs. And what this looks like at the moment is uh, we've more than doubled our ICT development capacity. The reason we did that is um, the COVID pandemic has seen a, a real change in the employment marketplace in Canberra, but also uh, the rest of the world across the nation in Australia. Um, ICT contractors and consultants are extremely uh, expensive. And so it's better for us to have these skills um, in-house. Uh, 
there's a couple of benefits to this. The first is that we're upskilling our other, other staff by having them shadow our new ICT developers. The second benefit is that we're able to develop a solution that's um, fit for purpose. So the IT developers in-house are able to sit with our collection team and understand their needs intricately. This doesn't mean that we um, that we are making bespoke systems. We're still buying our off-the-shelf off the systems, but we are tailoring those to the needs of the organisation. I'll talk now about a couple of pilot projects that the NFSA has been involved in. Uh, and they're really interesting and exciting projects, actually. Um, uh, the first being our foray into machine learning with the NFSA. Um, and we did that with a company called Grey Matter using a software called Curio. Um, the second project I'll talk about if there's time is um, a, a collaboration we're doing with RMIT, and that is to look into what blockchain developments will do for audiovisual archives in terms of tracing our digital content. So the first prior project here on the screen you can see is um, the project uh, using Curio software for machine learning. Our Curio pilot project um, had a few objectives here. We wanted to explore how we can unlock hidden value in our content by um, having automated metadata um, disclose and unlock where certain items are hidden within our digital collections. We wanted to understand how the software could help us to curate the collections that were coming into the archives. And that's again by leveraging that digital metadata. Uh, we wanted to understand the different use cases and where we would best be, uh, where we would get best bang for our buck um, in using machine learning. And finally, we wanted to understand just how hard it would be to integrate a system such as this with, of course, our digital asset management system, which is of a different vintage and of a different, um, different use entirely. So I'll flick through a couple of um, the uh, key highlights that came out of this pilot project, which I can say the NFSA will be moving ahead with this, uh, this solution. We deemed it a, a success. The first is Curio has allowed us to use facial recognition, and that's exciting. It's a lot easier than us um, looking at uh, how we've accessioned that data in the past. It looks at things like logo detection, for example. So you can see in the background of this picture there the logos of uh, Nikon and, and Kodak films. It can be used to help us out with copyright information so it can search for the term copyright and help us to then use that information to then feed back into our digital asset management system and help to fill in some of the gaps there. And um, as all audiovisual archives know the world over, there's many gaps in, in terms of the copyright information available for each of our digital assets. And that information is imperative before we go and share that content. Uh, of course, it, it detects location. Um, something as obvious as the Sydney Harbour Bridge is um, obviously easy to de detect, but in Australia um, and around the world, um, it's going to be fascinating to be able to see and drill down on what we can what we can discover for regional communities about the history of those communities, what we can unlock from our collection. I'll move on now to another area of digital development for the NFSA, and that has been in the space of digitization. Uh, in June last year, uh, we received five and a half million dollars from the federal government of Australia to digitize our at-risk collections. Um, and this, you know, we all celebrated, we've been waiting for that moment and we upscaled our operations. We needed to upscale our operations really at pace. So we've spent, the first part of this project has been spent um, doing a lot of procurement of ICT infrastructure and also the digitization equipment. So the outputs, the digitization outputs, we're not seeing the outputs increased dramatically at this point, but we will later this financial year and into the next year. This is a picture of uh, what we are affectionately referring to as Cineworld. 
It's a group of our Cinedex that we've just, um, this is hot off the press, a photo taken from earlier today. We're just installing these. So this will allow us to dramatically increase um, the volume of, of video digitisation that we can do. Uh, for every one person manning the machines, we're able to um, digitise four streams of content at once. This is going to help us reach our digitisation target of magnetic tape, as we know that will perish by 2025 unless, unless we can get to it before then. Um, we've also significantly increased our digitisation of audio material. We've added three new audio digitisation studios increasing our capacity from seven to 10 studios. Film digitization is also increasing. Um, there's been a steady increase um, over 2020 to 21, um, but we have for this funding focused on our magnetic tape, which is most at risk. We've also focused on our behind the scenes digital uplift, which has been our, um, we've had to focus on our storage, on-site storage and also our connectivity between the equipment and our network, and of course our storage capacity. We've also had to hire a whole whole lot of new staff, and we're thrilled to have um, a, a, to have seen interest from a younger generation who's joined our staff and are excited and invigorated to be part of digitising the heritage of our of our country. Um, this picture, you know, this is of a uh, digital storage in uh, 1964 or thereabouts and um, how things have changed and how things have changed very quickly. Um, in terms of our digital storage requirements at the NFSA right at this moment, we have a need for five and a half petabytes of storage for our collection, but we anticipate that that's going to increase to 110 petabytes by 2025. Um, for us, this sees us as one of the, it'll be one of the largest um, storage requirements of, um, of content, definitely the largest in, in Canberra, in Australia's capital, but um, throughout the nation, it will still be one of the largest. And that is, as, as the audience would well, well know, um, due to the size of the files that we need to store, the film files, um, and to a lesser extent, video files. So we are looking at building our own storage capacity um, on site. Um, a cloud solution is prohibitively expensive for us at this stage. Um, and I was uh, delighted to hear Linda's keynote uh, speech this morning, where she spoke a bit about LTO8 tape, uh, which is what we are using, and, um, and how it's at this point in time, um, a relatively sustainable option for, for archives the world over until we can move to something more exciting in the future, such as storage on DNA, if we can, uh, if we can get that to a safe standard. So as you can see, we have been um, busy moving on these projects at the NFSA to, to start our digital transformation, but we also have a few more in train that are in planning. And I'd like to pass over to my colleague, Jackie Ullman now, who can present on those. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And I'll just take a minute to share my screen. We'll swap over. Um, yeah. Um, I'll just confirm. Can you see that? Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so just uh, taking you through our plans for the future, and I wanted to talk to you about a future priority in the digital transformation space and some projects that we have either planned for the year ahead or down the track. As Nancy said, we've really, um, we're, we're well advanced on the digi digital transformation journey. A lot has happened already. But what we've found is that in doing that, the fact that our digital workflows and some of our digital infrastructure is now out of date is becoming more and more obvious and more of a barrier to us really having some of those seamless digital workflows in place. Um, so essentially what we're finding is that um, we've hit a critical point now as our digitization work takes off, as we bring in some of that new technology and new source in the world, um, and as we have requirements for storage um, and also access that we really need to focus on what we're calling the digital build over the next couple of years. Um, so the priorities for that are firstly focusing on our digital 
uh, workflows, making sure that we have um, a seamless integration of uh, processes to manage um, collection items, both born digital and digitised, um, and um, the... Uh, uh, excuse me a minute, I'll just... Um, Make sure we can share. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. So we're going back to uh, the priorities that we have. Um, we are currently looking at, over the next two years, focusing on a digital workflows build, and that's what we're calling uh, a cluster of projects which are designed to really service our, um, our collecting activity and our sharing activity and preservation going forward. Um, within that, the projects that we're working on now that I wanted to talk about are, you'll see there, collection acquisitions portal, search the collection update, and a platform to provide seamless access to the collection, what we're calling our user access platform. So the digital workflows, essentially the focus for us in that is um, reducing, building a system that is integrated from beginning to end in terms of collection management. We're looking at doing um, uh, you know, implementing processes that introduce automation wherever possible, that reduce manual handling by staff of files and data as it comes in, that helps us to track material and that synchronizes our systems together. We're also looking to upscale some components and Nancy spoke about the need for storage and the, the dramatic increase we have in storage over the next few years. The plan is that we'll free up skilled staff over time, particularly the curators, but also our um, specialists in preservation or conservation collection management by removing some of those processing components and particularly as the volume of material increases, that processing is um, using up increasingly more time of our, of our staff. It's really what I'd hope would be freeing people up to be the, um, you know, the experts that they are and to be able to work on some of the, the projects they're passionate about in, um, in really working with our collection. So we're treating this uh, body of work as, it, while it's a group of projects, it's actually an enterprise-wide project for the NFSA. One of our main pro projects within this is an acquisitions portal. Um, obviously, when Nancy spoke about the massive increase in uh, the material that is coming to us, particularly born digital, but we obviously also have an extensive analog collection that is increasingly being digitized. Um, at the moment, in terms of acquisitions coming into the collection, the onus is on our curatorial team to receive that material, to enter details into the, our asset management system. Um, there are a number of processes that require manual movement of data, um, things like um, virus checking, creation of checksums, quality control are not integrated in the system. So what we're planning to do is to build a portal which will allow donors or um, stakeholders depositing material with us for the collection to actually enter their data online. It places the owner on their onus on them to describe material to provide us with uh, details that are then brought and in, ingested into our system. We're hoping that once this is introduced, it will free up hundreds of hours of curators and accessioners' time. Um, and that will be material you know, time that they can then use on, as I said, researching, analysing, sharing a collection. So the next pro project we're looking at, and this is from our website, is our Search the Collection interface. It's one of our major interfaces for research and providing access to the collection for our stakeholders. Um, many of you would know that uh, about four to five years ago, the NFSA um, rebuilt its website and we're very lucky to have beautiful interface to, um, to uh, talk about our activities with our stakeholders. Unfortunately, our search the collection function was not updated as part of that. And what we have now is something that's a little bit clunky and um, possibly is outdated, but also doesn't allow for a full search of our collection because it doesn't synchronize with our asset management system. So over the next couple of years, we'll invest in a new search the collection database. Um, that will include you know, a, a build of a nice shell that is, meets people's expectations for the way that we can search information now. Um, 
Longer term, we'd like to integrate this with a use portal, um, but that's possibly down the track. This will be about a discoverability uh, mechanism for our collection. Um, and we will also work with obviously existing platforms like Trove, the Australian um, Library Search Database, to make sure that we're, our collection is discoverable through that mechanism. And finally, we are working on, and we're in the early days of this, a proposal for a, an access platform for our collection material. One of our collection, uh, our priorities that Nancy mentioned is to share our collection with the Australian public and with stakeholders. And we do this through a number of means, including by providing content digitally to external stakeholders for use and reuse. So that might be a filmmaker, a film society for screenings. It might be loaning uh, content for exhibitions. At the moment, this process is still fairly manual and providing content can be problematic, particularly where we're providing access to digital material and files are large. There's a lot of um, manual processing involved in getting that information to our stakeholders. So what we're looking at is building an access platform in which we could provide seamless, um, seamless content or seamless access to collection content for our users. One of the things that this is linked to, and we're mindful of the need to make sure that our collection is digitally available, and so it links care closely to a digitisation activity, but also that we have rights clearances um, and we're, we're aware of copyright details for the collection. So this is something that we're looking at resourcing in line with the build of this access platform. So as I said, it's still in very early days, but that's something that we want to get to having as a, a means of sharing and providing access to, to the collection. So finally, I, that takes us back to our building, which is firmly analog, but also deeply digital on the inside and will be in two years, um, our home of a digital infrastructure that provides seamless access to the collection allows us to take in material and share it with our stakeholders. Um, obviously, we are aiming to upscale and continue our world-class digital preservation activities, and um, we'll make sure that we have a workforce with the digital skills we need to evolve and to continue to deliver our, our services in this environment. So that takes us to the end of our presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, you. Nancy and uh, Jackie. Um, normally, we would have had the presentation from Malawi, but for some technical reasons, we are unable to continue with that one because the person is not in a position to present. So I know that um, you were talking about um, uh, wanting to do something on blockchain, so you can uh, take this opportunity to do so. So floor is yours again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I, I skipped over that part of the presentation. I didn't think we had time. But um, the NFSA has partnered with RMIT, the um, uh, Institute of Technology in Melbourne, uh, to work. They've got a blockchain hub, a bunch of researchers that are doing a lot of work in the blockchain space. Um, obviously, there are already products on the market uh, for many for many uses of blockchain. We're working with RMIT specifically to explore how blockchain can be used for archival purposes. Uh, we would, I guess we would like to know um, that once we have a digital asset that is available in the world, um, that it hasn't been tampered with, it hasn't been changed, and it hasn't been copied. Um, so it helps us in terms of managing our licensing and rights, um, and it also helps us to ensure that we maintain our trust and integrity as an archive. We need to, um, all of us uh, the world over, need to ensure that archives maintain that single source of truth, um, the capture of the original, the original audiovisual uh, or moving image. So that's where we're at with blockchain. Um, we're still in the research phase at the moment, so we've the NFSA has shared a portion of our collection with the um, researchers and they will they use that to do some testing on some products um, in a secure environment and, um, and we're going to stay close with those researchers um, over the course of this year to see what, how we can work with a, a finished product. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've just received word that the second presenter has arrived. Um, so I will call on them to make a quick presentation and then we will continue on to a question and answer, okay? So the second speaker is um, going to present a focus on the impact of technology on the management of audiovisual archives in Malawi. Now in Malawi, there is no separate national audiovisual archives. So you will learn how the national archives has dealt with the various and enormous challenges in preserving the national production from both government and non-governmental sources, including issues of budget and staffing and so on, which all AV archives are familiar with. The presenter is Innocent Mangwala, who holds a degree, a, a master's degree in social studies education, is currently working as the chief archivist with the National Archives of Malawi. Work involves providing professional advice to public admin, um, institutions on good records, management practices, appraising and ensuring safety and safe custody of records for posterity and research. Uh, Innocent, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you are able to hear me. Uh, I would like to request if my slides can be shared from there. Hello, everyone. And uh, greetings from Malawi. Um, I know with the different time zones uh, in Vietnam, this is uh, in the afternoon. My presentation is based on it's based on the national archives of Malawi. I'm looking at the technological changes uh, and the management of audiovisual archives uh, in Malawi. We can move on to the next slide. Briefly, uh, the National Archives of Malawi is a government department which was established in July 1947. Uh, it is a legal keeper and preserver of public goods. And uh, the National Archives of Malawi derives its mandate from the National Archives Act. Uh, and the Printed Publication Act of the Law of Power. Uh, the National Archives Act empowers uh, the National Archives to collect, classify, conserve, store, and dispose uh, certain kind of records, judicial, historical, and general records. Uh, and on the other hand, the Printed Publications Act empowers the National Archives to collect, preserve uh, the published works and register newspapers. Uh, these two acts empower the National Archives to preserve and provide access of the country's documental heritage. Uh, these comprise of public records and archives, printed works that document lives of Malawians activities of the government, the accountability and credibility of the national institutions. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Now, understanding the issue of uh, audiovisual archives, um, audiovisual archives can be understood based on this uh, definition by the US National Archives and Records Administration 2016, uh, which says audiovisual records uh, a collection that include motion picture, motion picture films, still photographs, film strips, sound video recordings, posters, uh, other graphic works, uh, and multimedia productions related to finding aids and production files. On the other hand, Jama uh, cited Ed, and the Mosons, 
Uh, in that audiovisual heritage includes recorded sound, radio, film, television, video, and other productions comprising moving images and the, uh, recorded soundings. Furthermore, audiovisual records are also defined as vital elements of our collective memory determining our achievements over years, uh, documenting our past, present, and determining our future. Uh, these are some of the key definitions when we are talking about audiovisual archives as part of a background to this discussion. Uh, let's proceed. So the National Archives has got several kind of materials um, in its custody as part of the audiovisual archives. Uh, we have VHS, we have Betacam, we have DVDs, audio cassettes, gramophone, projector films, we have CDs, we have microfiche, and we have microfilms. Uh, these records are generally obtained from the Malawi Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, this is a state a broadcasting institution. Uh, it's the main one, and also the Ministry of Information. But at the same time, the National Archives uh, also uh, houses or stores uh, some audiovisual Hello? Innocent, Hi. can you hear me? I think we have lost our speaker. Okay. Uh, I in the meantime, as we try to get them back, um, there is a question that has come up for um, NFSA. And uh, the first question is, what is the technology stack for the data analytics dashboard? Sorry, that question uh, to repeat was, what is the technology used for the data analytics dashboard? Yes, technology stack. Yeah. So. Um, at the moment, we used, um, well, our first, our first challenge was to retrieve the data out of our MediaFlex asset management system. Um, this wasn't as easy as it should be, um, as those who have tried can attest to. Uh, we pulled that out um, and we have a constant refresh going into that shadow database. And then we run the analytics over the top of that um, and at this stage, we're using um, Python scripts that have been developed in-house. The reason um, this analytics is based on in-house um, in -house scripts at this stage is due to the um, nature of the data that was underlying in the MediaFlex system. Um, it was extremely complicated to, um, to consolidate and fill in those gaps in the integrity of the data. So we, we, um, we wrote our bespoke scripts for this one. Okay. And uh, there was a second question, why should we wait for the connection to come back? And uh, the question is, 5.5 PB now to projected storage to 110 PB by 2025 or 2035? Unfortunately, it's 2025. I wish we had till 2035, but uh, that's our predictions for our increase in digitization is that we will need 110 petabytes by 2025. Okay, thank you. Um, innocent, or do we have the connection again? Are you back? Yes, just give me two minutes. Okay. Yes. Um, let me know when you're ready. All right. And uh, Nancy, you talked about digital dexterity. Um, has this resulted in a reduced staff, or have you managed then to just change your staff and structure as a result of this? I think um, we've actually shifted resources. We haven't reduced our staff numbers um, within the last... We did reduce them in 2019 for a restructure that we did, um, but what we're doing now is shifting resources into the IT space. So when positions become vacant, uh, we're then moving on the IT need. 
Mm-hmm. We're also at the same time upskilling staff across the organisation with some internal digital training um, training courses that we're doing. Okay. Okay. Are we ready with Innocent now? This. Okay. Yeah, hello? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, sincere apologies for uh, the disruption in network. Okay, so we, we can go to the next slide. Uh, on this particular slide, I was talking about the sources of our visual archives. Uh, that they have come from the, uh, the Malay Broadcasting Corporation, which is the main state broadcaster as well as the uh, Minister of Information. So uh, this uh, study, basically, I wanted it to address three questions, uh, uh, whether there are policies and strategies in place to support your visual archives of Malawi. The second one was how do the creating institutions manage their audiovisual archives before they are uh, transferred to the National Archives? And also, what are the impact uh, of the technological changes on access preservation and storage of audiovisual archives. Uh, we can proceed. The next slide. Uh, it has been observed uh, that uh, the field of archives and records management has consistently been facing a number of difficulties and failures, especially in the management of audiovisual archives. Uh, several studies uh, have highlighted challenges that are, that are faced in the management of such collections. Some of the challenges are lack of properly trained personnel, a lack of purpose-built infrastructure, lack of equipment, uh, these are shelves, thermometers, air conditioners, computers, scanners. The National Archives of Malawi is not exceptional uh, to the highlighted difficulties since the establishment of the National Archives of Malawi 72 years ago, uh, it, has not, it, has been, uh, it has been a custody of audiovisual archives generated by uh, several government and non-governmental agencies. Uh, this paper intends to look at the technological changes that are, and uh, the impact that it has had on the storage access preservation of audiovisual collections. Uh, in the National Archives of Malawi. We can proceed. Uh, this study was, it was mainly a test study and the National Archives of Malawi was the uh, main area of the study. Uh, the population was drawn from there. Uh, the director of the National Archives, the head of conservation, anthropographer, the librarian, the principal archivist, documentation officer, assistant archivist, these were consulted. And also since some of the main creators of these records are the uh, Malay Broadcasting Corporation and the Minister of Information, the librarian and the ICT officer from these institutions were also involved. So a questionnaire was distributed and then collected afterwards uh, with responses. And uh, the people that were given these questionnaires uh, responded accordingly. Uh, let's move forward. In terms of this uh, strategy, as you remember, one of the uh, key questions for this study was to see if there are strategies in place and uh, whether the strategies are working. Uh, it was observed that uh, it was observed uh, by several scholars, including the ones listed here, uh, that the level of preservation is upheld by the policies and strategies that archival media organizations put in place, failure to adhere to established standards in the management of audiovisual materials should be a cause of concern for audiovisual archivists uh, in the region and world over. Uh, in the same vein, the Homer 2012 stated that the work of archivists is determined by the way the site records, stores, and disposes information. He further asserted uh, that uh, the records, the effectiveness of archivists in the post called custodial error. Uh, that means after the records have been moved from the creating agency now in the custody of the archives, 
uh, is determined by their ability to change uh, their past behavior and coming up with strategies to cope up with new opportunities, problems uh, created by the new information revolution. The National Archives Act, as I stated in the beginning, uh, provide for the preservation of all forms of records. And that being the case, it includes audiovisual collections and electronic records. I must mention that the National Archives Act is also going under review because yeah, it, it talks about audiovisual archives, but in general sense, but now I want to uh, specifically look at the issues. Uh, so the, policy, the, uh, the Archives Act uh, is also being assisted by the records management policy, uh, which was developed by the National Archives and uh, is being used by National Archives and also the creating agencies. Uh, another slide. Now, management of audiovisual archives uh, before they are transferred to the National Archives, because the National Archives, as I said, does not uh, generate uh, its own records, rather, it is keeping the records that are being generated by uh, other institutions and the, in, 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 to a great extent, uh, the public institutions. So the major source of uh, audiovisual materials for the National Archives is the Ministry of Information, as I said earlier on, and also the Malay Broadcasting Corporation. The items are collected from the two institutions, uh, are collected from the two from time to time, and these items are categorized according to their subjects and the period as they were, uh, as which was used in collecting them. However, the items are transferred to the archives as a finished product. In many cases, the National Archives is not involved uh, in how the items were stored at the institution. This is a challenge that both the National Archives and the great institutions, uh, they are supposed to resolve because the National Archives is supposed to have these items or to be to be part of the process on how they are managed at their point of uh, point of creation. So the National Archives is supposed to provide guidance, supposed to provide direction. At the point of creation. So others, okay, it's fine. Uh, the above observations have explained uh, in summer, I can say scholars, what they are saying is that the National Archive is not involved in many cases in the process of managing the, the audiovisual collections at the creation phase, but rather it's, uh, they are found more at the uh, long-term storage phase, whereby the records are transferred to the archives. So the above observation fulfills the major records and management net, indeed, that activists should participate in decisions about how records are stored before they come to the archives. This environment involves setting standards which must be adhered to before the records are transferred uh, to the archives. Yes, and let's move on. We have looked at uh, the creation part. We have looked at the policy part in terms of policies and strategies, and also uh, the management of the records uh, at the a creation phase, and um, now we want to look at the impact of technological change. Uh, I, I just singled out three items because these are the main ones we have got access, and we've got storage, and we've got preservation. So on the part of access, uh, what we are seeing is that from time immemorial, uh, cultural heritage institutions, archives, libraries, museums, uh, these that are are responsible for audiovisual collections. I have been using traditional techniques, uh, analog in this sense, but uh, they were able to have access to the information, but now things have been changing. There's been evolution uh, in the change of technology. And now accessibility by the public of audiovisual archives, uh, especially at the National Archives of Malawi now, uh, is done following some procedures because the change in technology has also brought the change in how people will have to access uh, the information. However, uh, one of the uh, protocols that we are following is that uh, a formal request has to be made if one has to access uh, the audiovisual archives. Uh, we have some materials which uh, 
we have the playback materials. But unfortunately, the other challenges, we have the audiovisual collection, and with the changes in technology, there is no playback uh, material, which poses a challenge uh, on how one can access uh, such kind of material. Here, when we are talking about access, we are talking about uh, being able to view if it's an audio, if it's a video, you are able to view it, or if it's an audio, you're able to listen to it. So with the changes, you find that uh, the playback material is uh, quite odd, and now you want to change it to the new digital information. But now for us to change, we still require uh, to refresh and use the, uh, the old playback materials. So audio, uh, audiovisual materials are accessed by viewing them right at the archives or by requesting a copy uh, or part of the item uh, which is prepared at a small cost. Okay, so quickly, another one is uh, uh, preservation. The constant change in technology was seen as a major challenge to the preservation of audiovisual records. A study viewed that the technological change has resulted in the following challenges uh, in order to properly preserve the audiovisual collection. So one of some of the challenges are lack of appropriate equipment needed to inspect and view such material, lack of qualified personnel to care for and maintain both material and the equipment, limited resources for engaging in audiovisual preservation and the, uh, reformat reformatting activities, inadequate training in the preservation of audiovisual uh, materials. A preservation of audiovisual materials uh, feature in the three main forms. Um, so this is more like a background of what preservation uh, means to us. Uh, it means conservation, it means restoration, and it also means uh, digitization. So currently the National Archives is in the process of doing a targeted digitization of real to real films. Are these films? contain all the content or contain mostly the life and government of the first and founding president of Malawi up to 1964. The digitization was started in 2017 and targets to digitize 500 real films. The process is slow because of the challenges highlighted above. However, there are also other films uh, in VHS, better come and mean DVs, that will require to be digitized in the near future, uh, subject to availability of appropriate equipment. Now let's move on. Now, uh, this is the last aspect because we've talked about access, we've talked about preservation, uh, the impact of technological change on storage. Uh, the study sought to determine Another issue the study sought to determine relates to the storage facilities available for storage of audiovisual records at the National Archives. Uh, it was recommended by Gala 2017 that there should be special equipment for the management of different types of materials, including audiovisual archives. It was also argued uh, that looking at the management of audiovisual collections, one gets the picture of an ever decreasing storage life. While the film is regarded stable with a storage life of over 100 years, if stored in favorable conditions. Nevertheless, chemical delay like vinegar syndrome is quite unpredictable in as much as efforts are being made to manage the audiovisual collections because of the problem, uh, because of the problems. National Archives has had over 1,000 reels damaged um, because they could not be migrated to digital format. So the, the problem was related to the records uh, in reels not being properly kept. As such, they were affected. At the National Archives of Malawi, a repository was designed to accommodate some of the audiovisual records. This room has open shelves and is for air conditioned. Furthermore, some are Furthermore, about some rules, I mean, DVs are boxed and kept in a separate room, but these 
boxes are not on shelves due to shortage of shelves. The situation I was also observed at the Malawi Broadcasting Corporation and also the Minister of Information. Yeah. So in conclusion, the paper has discussed technological change and the impact in the management of audiovisual collections for National Archives of Malawi. It has been uh, stated that the collections are collected mainly from live broadcasting and also the Ministry of Information. It has been observed that policies and strategies are in place at the National Archives, but the challenge in enforcing these policies, specifically in the management of uh, audiovisual collections that are in their current state. Uh, that's the main challenge. The study has also established that technological change has affected accessibility, preservation, and storage of audiovisual collections. In addition, other factors include our absence of playback equipment, staffing, lack of training and funding, and also the society perceptions towards archives, uh, the challenge in technological awareness, and also climatic issues. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. This marks the end uh, of the presentation. There are some of the reference materials. Apologies for the uh, hiccup we had with, uh, with the network. I uh, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have much time left, so I think I'll just want to throw out one of the questions that has come up and it is addressed to NFSA. What is your strategy to staff retention as staff with good IT skills tend to leave after a while? I don't know who wants to take this one on. <laughs> Look, I think that it's a problem that we're all facing. Um, we have noticed that post the COVID pandemic, there have been, our staff base has been seeking the stability of a government organisation. So that has been a, a draw card for the NFSA to retain staff. Um, in terms of ongoing activities that we can do, um, we're working hard to maintain a culture that's one that staff want to be part of. And we also work to develop those staff, especially in the IT space, by cross-skilling between different teams. So we've heard back from the staff that we've employed that that's something they've been appreciative of. Um, learning different codes, different types of work within the IT space. But um, having said that, it is a challenge and we we uh, do lose so much time with recruitment, so much time and money. So, agree. <laughs> okay. okay. Maybe we have time for one more before we um, close. Um, this one is, what are some of the challenges encountered in using face recognition and local location detection technologies on archival footage? And how did you overcome them? Um, I would say that, and, and I guess the second part of the question I can see there is interesting as well. I'll answer both. Um, in terms of face recognition, it is a developing technology and there is going to be some hiccups along the way in terms of that data being correct. Um, uh, so we're working on developing the Q&A component um, of that process. We've only used this software as part of a pilot, but we are going to roll it out across the rest of the collection. So as far as the NFSA is concerned, um, it will be part of the future. Um, it's not just seen as a trial. Um, we will be using it more and more um, as, as our collection grows. And if it's not this software, then it will be another. Um, it, we have weighed up the benefits um, and the, the positives and the negatives. And while some information um, over time may be highlighted as being incorrect and needed to be updated, um, the benefits of the collection being searchable um, in all these different ways far outweighs the, outweighs the negatives there. We're working on different ways to combat that over time. Thank you. Okay. I think we have well, come to the end of the session, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Given the time zones, I'm a bit confused about how much time, but I think we were supposed to finish at 10.15 um, my time. Uh, I'm not sure what time it is where you are. <laughs> um, 
So it just remains for me to thank um, all of the panelists for their informative contributions. Um, what we have learned is that um, the different issues that arise, no matter the level of development of an institution, is that they are common to all audiovisual archives. Um, we, did, we do apologize for the technical issue, which unfortunately do arise in these events. But nevertheless, I think that this has been a very informative session. And uh, I just thank everyone again, once again, for their contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.